while the last video sought just to define penal substitution and then to locate it within the early church tradition, the present one will ask whether the Bible actually supports this idea of penal substitution. For indeed, it doesn't matter if Athanasius and Augustine endorse it if the scriptures don't. And so let's begin with some key ideas for penal substitution. The first of which is the idea of sacrifice. And one place that penal substitution is often found within the Bible by particular scholars is in the theme of sacrifice. In the Old Testament, God clearly commands blood sacrifice as a means of atonement. And yet, how exactly this atonement works has been a subject of some debate. One clue, according to Leviticus, is that the life of the creature is seen as being, quote, in the blood. Therefore, it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life, Leviticus 17.11. And in response to this idea, a later biblical author even claims that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness, Hebrews chapter 9. Now, John Goldengay, an Old Testament scholar, has some qualms about the idea that sacrifice necessarily means penal substitution, so we, we need to listen to him. He says, Sacrifice for Israel does not involve penal substitution in the sense that one entity bears another, another's punishment. By laying hands on the offering, the offerers identify with it and pass on to it not their guilt, but their stain. The offering is then not vicariously punished, but rather vicariously cleansed. That's John Goldengay's critique of the idea that sacrifice entails penal substitution. Now, he's certainly right to say that not all sacrifices are examples of penal substitution. However, the idea of a penalty or a judgment in some sacrifices is hard to ignore. Ancient covenants often included sacrifices, and these sacrificial ceremonies included the acted out curses for breaking the covenant, which were clearly penal in their nature. For instance, by passing through the divided pieces of the sacrificial victim, the implication was clear in the covenant ceremony. May this happen to me and more if I break the words of the covenant. Yet, in Genesis 15, one of these sacrificial ceremonies, the stunning fact is that it's actually God who passes between the pieces, not Abraham. Abraham's actually asleep on the ground. And according to this logic, it is God in Genesis chapter 15 who is placing himself on the line if the agreement should be broken. Likewise, some sacrifices were explicitly substitutionary. A bit further in the Genesis story, we read that Abraham took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering, quote, instead of his son, Isaac, in Genesis chapter 22. The substitution here cannot be doubted. It's instead of his son that the ram is sacrificed. And so my conclusion is that we can't discount the penal substitutionary symbolism of at least some Old Testament sacrifices. Now let's look at a particular ceremony in the Old Testament that is relevant. That is the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. Leviticus 16 tells us about this and it says that on this day the high priest entered the Holy of Holies to make atonement for sins not covered by the other sacrifices. While the ritual of Yom Kippur has several parts, the most important for my purposes here is that involving the two goats. In the passage, it says that Aaron is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering, but the goat chosen by lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. That's Leviticus chapter 16, verses 8 through 10. 
Then, after the first goat is slaughtered, it says that Aaron is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins. And then it says to put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. And the goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place and the man shall release it in the wilderness. Leviticus 16, 21 and 22. In the words of Tom Schreiner, he says that the live goat functions as the substitute that bears the penalty, eviction or exile to the desert for Israel's sins. And it might seem odd that the animal's death is not mentioned explicitly. It bears reminding that for Israel, exile is the paradigmatic punishment for sin. In Leviticus, to be banished from the camp is to experience God's penalty for sin. And it could be argued that death is merely the ultimate form of exile because it's to be exiled from the land of the living. So does the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, include some element of penal substitution? Some have argued that the worshiper is actually bound up with one or both of the goats. And so that what we have is really more an inclusive place taking rather than a penal substitution. This inclusive place taking wording is that of the Tubingen perspective on the Day of Atonement. But to revisit an argument I made when we talked about recapitulation, these ideas of incorporation, bound togetherness, participation, or union, they're, they're all important and they're all true biblically. We don't have to choose just one or the other. But these ideas of bound togetherness don't rule out some level of substitution, specifically at the levels we mentioned earlier of agency. Jesus is the agent bringing about atonement, not me. And sensory experience. I don't experience the cross. He does. So too, the worshiper doesn't experience exile to the wilderness. The, the goat does. The worshiper doesn't die. It's presumably, the, the goat does. And so some level of substitution is clearly present in Yom Kippur with regard to the scapegoat. Because while the people may be pictured as spiritually bound up with the animal, they don't physically experience that exile and that presumed death nor do they personally embark on that lonely walk of banishment and condemnation. After the sins of the people are figuratively placed on the head of the scapegoat, it's the animal alone that is physically banished, while the people, at least physically speaking, stand in communion with God in the midst of the camp. In short, there is both penalty bearing and substitution depicted in the Day of Atonement. Now, to complete our three examples from the Old Testament, let's turn to the example of the suffering servant in Isaiah, because even more than the Day of Atonement, Isaiah's suffering servant often is held up as the clearest possible example of penal substitutionary logic in the Old Testament. Isaiah says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Isaiah 53 verse 5. In the New Testament, the passage is then applied to Jesus. Most notably, 1 Peter 2, 24 through 25 states, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, Peter says, you have been healed for you were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Peter draws from the suffering servant passage and applies it to Jesus. In response, some argue that Isaiah 53 only presents us with a servant who suffers with or as the people rather than instead of them. Yet, Peter's reference to this passage seems to go beyond that view when he says that Jesus, the servant, he himself bore 
our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. This seems to be referencing something that Jesus took on or experienced instead of us. And in some, it's very hard to read the New Testament allusions to the servant without seeing some kind of penal substitutionary logic at work. Jesus experiencing something in our place instead of us under the will of God. Now, let's turn from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And turning to the Gospels, one image of penal substitution is that of the cup that Christ must figuratively drink. In Gethsemane, the Lord cries out, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Matthew 26. Throughout the scriptures, the cup is often associated with God's wrath, a symbol of divine judgment. Psalm 75 verse 8 is, is just one example of this. In the hand of the Lord, the psalmist writes, is a cup filled of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. And with this context in mind, this cup of judgment or penalty, Christ's willingness to drain the cup fits perfectly with the penal aspects of atonement, that he takes upon himself willingly and graciously the judgment that we deserve. He drinks it to its dregs. A second case study in the Gospels themselves involves Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest, who unintentionally utters words of prophecy about Jesus. Caiaphas says, it's better that one man should die for the people than that the whole nation should perish. Now, this is said with the calculated chill of political pragmatism and cynicism as far as Caiaphas is concerned. But the writer of John views this as an inadvertent statement of prophecy and even atonement doctrine. And he chimes in and says, he did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. John's gospel says that. As the high priest, Caiaphas' words carry sacrificial connotations, a death on behalf of the people. But in this case, it's clear that the sacrificial victim is not merely dying for or with the people, but also instead of them. It would be better, Caiaphas says, for one man to die instead of the whole nation perish. This is a substitutionary death. Now let's turn from the Gospels to the Apostle Paul. And having talked about the Old Testament and the stories of Jesus, we now finish out our survey, survey by looking to what Paul says. And we don't have time for the entire Pauline corpus, but we can look at just a, a few important sections or passages. In Romans 8, 1 through 4, one of the, the great, beautiful mountain vistas of biblical uh, passages, Paul tells with exuberance that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might fully be met in us. Those who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Romans chapter 8 verses 1 through 4. Now, in this passage, condemnation, katakrima, is quite clearly penal language. It's a penalty. And the text tells us that Christians face none of it. There is now no condemnation, Paul says, because God condemned sin in the flesh of Christ, Paul writes. At this point, there is both clarity and nuance in Paul's atonement doctrine. 
He does not say flatly that somehow God punished Jesus or God tortured Christ, nor does he say that the father was personally angry or hateful towards the son, as if the Trinity could ever be divided or that God could be pitted against God. By no means. In Romans 8, sin, Paul says, not the son, is the ultimate target of God's cross-directed condemnation. God condemned sin in the flesh of Christ. Yet, it so happens that this sin is carried or born in the flesh of him who knew no sin. And this is possible, as I've argued previously, because all humanity is somehow bound up with the Christ, the true Adam as our head. And because Christ's flesh is one with him, Jesus experiences the condemnation of sin as if it were a divine judgment on his very person, despite the fact that God is not hateful or angry with the Son. In the view of Romans 8, God condemned human sin in the flesh of Christ so that the redeemed experience no condemnation, but rather righteousness in Christ. And here too, the ground for justification and imputation rests upon the incorporative union between Christ and humanity, that we're bound together, bound up with Christ. And with regard to condemnation, the language is clearly penal. The act occurs under divine sanction or by God's will. And there is also substitution because Christ experiences the weight of divine judgment and crucifixion while we do not. So while humanity is bound up with Christ in the realm of active agency and sensory experience, this experience is his alone. This is the gospel, and it is also one that involves penal substitution. Now, a lot more biblical passages could be cited and need to be cited, but the prior case studies that we've walked through are sufficient to demonstrate that the logic of mere penal substitution, it is present in the canon of scripture and not merely just in church tradition. Now, we need to be careful here because it's not to say that every version of penal substitution is in fact a biblical one. Instead, what I've attempted to do and to demonstrate is that a blanket dismissal of penal substitution on the grounds of biblical evidence has been weighed and has now been found wanting. Thus, with the treatment of the canon now concluded, we'll turn next to address some other critiques of penal substitution under the headings of divine character and contemporary culture.